Thursday night at the communion service, just to remind you, from today, the Diocesan authorities have given permission to restore the common cup Please turn to page 201 in your prayer books. Christ is risen. Hallelujah. And we join in the colic for purity, Almighty God, Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ says. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself, on these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Lord, have mercy on us and write these, your laws, in our hearts. God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, Jesus Christ, to save us from our sins, to intercede for us in heaven, and to bring us to eternal life. Let us then confess our sins in penitence and faith, firmly resolved to keep God's commandments and to live in love and peace. Please be seated for prayer. Let us pray. And just in a moment of quiet reflection, let us open our hearts to God and acknowledge those things of thought, word, and deed that have not been consistent with our profession as Christian people.
And so we pray together. Almighty God, Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned in thought and word and deed, and in what we have left undone. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may walk in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon us, pardon and deliver us from all our sins, confirm and strengthen us in all goodness, and keep us in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And we stand as we say together the Gloria, glory to God in the highest. On this Easter day, let us praise God through the words of this, this hymn. Glory to God. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to God's people on earth. Lord God, Heavenly King, Almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, Receive our prayer, for you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, and the glory of God the Father. Amen. Please be seated. And we use the collect of this first Sunday of Easter, Easter Day, as we come together to celebrate Jesus' resurrection. O God, who for our redemption didst give thine only begotten Son to the death of the cross, and by his glorious resurrection has delivered us from the power of our enemy, grant us so to die daily from sin that we may evermore live with him in the joy of his resurrection through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The epistle reading this morning is a reading from Romans chapter 12, verses 9 to 21, and can be found on page 153 of the New Testament of the Pew Bibles. Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal. Be ardent in spirit, serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope, be patient in suffering. Persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you Bless, do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not claim to be anything else. Do not repay any evil for evil. For take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourself, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. No, if your enemy are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap her burning coals on their heads. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This is the word of the Lord. We stand for the reading of the Gospel. Hear the Gospel of our Saviour Christ according to St Luke, chapter 24, beginning at verse 1. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, 
they and certain other women with them came to the tomb bringing the spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in, did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened, as they were greatly perplexed about this, that, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Then, as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He's not here, but is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered Jesus' words. Then they returned from the tomb and told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. And their words seemed to them like idle tales, and they did not believe them. But Peter arose and ran to the tomb, and stooping down he saw the linen cloths lying by themselves, and he departed, marvelling to himself as to what had happened. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. We bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, grant us wisdom through the exploration of the meaning and application of the Beatitudes to our lives, so we may be spiritually enriched and renewed in our understanding of your love for us through faith in Jesus as Saviour and Lord. We pray this in his name and for his sake. Amen. Please be seated. This morning we conclude our studies in the Beatitudes. Let me just read to you the final two. Verses 9 and 10 of chapter 5 of Matthew's Gospel. Jesus said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. On this day of resurrection, when we celebrate Jesus' victory over death, thereby setting his seal upon his promise of eternal life to all who believe in him, we rejoice that he has removed the fear and the sting of death, a reality that lies at the heart of the gospel. Now every believer, as a professed son or daughter of God, through faith in Jesus as Saviour and as Lord, is called to share this good news with others. That is, in the light of the text, to be a peacemaker. A peacemaker is someone who preaches the gospel of peace as devised, planned, prepared, and presented in the life of work and witness of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace. The role of a peacemaker is to invite others to make their peace with God through repentance from sin and faith in Jesus as Saviour and to make him the Lord of their lives. And if any of you should feel inclined after our studies to try and share that peace with others, I have a little booklet called Steps to Peace with God that you may like to have a copy of and pass on to somebody else as an act of witness to encourage them to be at peace with God and to allow you as a peacemaker to build that gap, bridge, as it were, between them and God our Father. However, as the final key of the kingdom reveals, there is potentially a price to be paid when we embrace this role of peacemaker as followers of Christ, the Prince of Peace, we need to face the reality of what Jesus says, that as a peacemaker you will face persecution. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, says Jesus, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And then he adds two more verses. Blessed are you 
when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. And you can only think of Jesus accused falsely of being a blasphemer and so on and what they did to him and persecuting him by nailing him to a cross. And so he goes on and says, Rejoice, rejoice, and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. But before we reach that beatitude of persecution, let's look first of all at what it means to be a peacemaker. It is undoubtedly true that making peace with others at a human level is not always easy. Well, why would that be? Well, there are those whose nature, attitudes and actions stir all kinds of negative emotions within us. Let's be honest about it. They're inclined to say, maybe someone else, they get up your nose, don't they? You've heard that expression, I'm sure. And one I picked up in the morns when I was there was, you couldn't love them even if you reared them. True? And thirdly, they never fail to rub you up the wrong way by their manner and attitude. Even Paul the Apostle acknowledges this when he says in Romans 12, verse 9, which was part of our epistle reading, For as much as lieth within you, be at peace with all men. So it's not always easy to have cordial relationships with everybody because of our own or their human nature. And so it could be said, of course, that by our nature and by our attitude and by our actions, we too can rub people up the wrong way. We all know that to be true. Even Paul had a fallout with his old friend Barnabas over a disagreement about Mark. Mark was Barnabas's nephew, and Paul and he, Barnabas, had an argument, and there was a fallout, a separation. And also in his letter to the Philippians, he implored, Paul implored two members of the congregation to use our language to catch themselves on and stop bickering with one another. You find that, if you like to look it up, Philippians 4, and verses 2 to 3. And yet these two people that Paul is counselling in this manner were people whom he respected as fellow travellers with him in following Christ. In order to manage our relationships with one another, we need to look to Jesus who, as the Prince of Peace, came sorry, to re reconcile us to himself and to one another. And this is the resurrection lifestyle that Paul describes in our epistle. Let me just read again some of the verses of that, of that chapter, just to remind us of the challenge of being a Christian. You see in verses 10, 14, and 16, Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love and honor, and honor giving preference to one another, putting the other person's needs first. That's the challenge. Verse 14, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. And then he says in verse 16, be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. This is the resurrection lifestyle that Jesus wants us to emulate because that's how he lived. For Jesus, the cost of his peacemaking was, we said already, his death on the cross. There, having been beaten and nailed to that cross, he cried out to God the Father to forgive those who executed him. That's some expression of love, isn't it? An affection and concern for those who had treated him so cruelly. And therefore, for us to be peacemakers and follow Jesus' example, it requires three things to be a peacemaker. Courage. To reach out in love, in the name of Jesus, to those with whom we are at variance. Conviction. 
that Jesus commands us to be reconciled to our neighbor, whoever they may be. And thirdly, compassion that requires us to share Jesus' love and mercy with others, whatever their attitude may be to us. In other words, peacemaking is not an easy path to follow if we are to be true to ourselves as sons and daughters of God and professed followers of the crucified and now risen Christ. And in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says something at the end of chapter 5 which is quite challenging and indeed disturbing. It's a deeper challenge at the heart of the Christian gospel in terms of our Christian discipleship. Now think about this. Jesus said to those who would follow him, Be ye perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Matthew 5, verse 48. Say it again. Be ye perfect, as your Father in heaven is perfect. Think about that. This is the big wow factor of our Christian experience. To reach that standard must be the Christian's goal and whatever whatever he or she thinks, says, or does. No wonder we need to constantly confess our sins for how many reach that level of perfection in their manner of life. The last beatitude highlights the cost we may pay for such a Christ-centered lifestyle. And this is the hard bit. I read again verses 11 and 12 just to remind you. Blessed Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for they so persecuted the prophets who were before you. You're blessed when people persecute you and revile you, says Jesus. The reality is, of course, that the righteousness of God, when expressed through the Bible, through the lips of those who are followers of Jesus, the righteousness of God exposes unrighteousness. Unrighteousness in ours and other people's lives. So the question is, what is righteousness that should give such offense? Well, the answer is simple. Righteousness is the spiritual and uh, the moral principles revealed in the word of God that you and I are meant to picture a mirror in our lives. So when we confess our sins and worship, we are publicly acknowledging unrighteousness in our thoughts and words and deeds. However, not everyone outside the walls of this church in the public arena embraces the biblical definitions of righteousness and unrighteousness, for that's where you live out your life outside the walls of this church. And the reality is that we now live in what is called a woke society, in which biblical standards of what is right and wrong are considered outdated and irrelevant. And prime examples of this are, one, society has redefined the biblical meaning of marriage, where women speak of their wives a men speak of their husbands. That was illustrated on a program the other day, and a gardening expert spoke about he and his husband were keen gardeners, or words to that effect. Society, secondly, has embraced common law partnerships, which we used to call, of course that means I'm a dinosaur when I talk like this, they used to be called living in sin. But now it's acceptable. How many times do you see people interviewed on the TV and they talk about their partner? They don't talk about their wife or their husband. It's about their partner. I read in the paper some time ago of this man whose wife had been in hospital. And he had to collect some item of equipment, maybe one of those... uh, 
frames that you use to help people walk. And so when he was signing in the form, signing the form, the form asked him, not who is your wife, but who is your bed partner? Refusing to use the word wife. Thirdly, the society is redefining the meaning of gender, where even the Labour leader, Sir Keith Starmer, and two of his MPs are unwilling to define precisely what a woman is because of the now relevant, prevalent, I should say, gender, transgender debate. It's amazing. And fourthly, society in Northern Ireland, through government legislation, has now recently removed respect for Christian, the Christian celebration of Easter by increasing licensing hours, whereas there had previously been a respect for the spiritual side of things as we acknowledge or did acknowledge in our society is central to our moral and spiritual lives have now increased the licensing hours. And so we could go on. But dare you object to any of these things, you're denounced as a bigot and maligned by woke warriors as accused of hate crimes. And of course that is a form of persecution. And you'd only go back a couple or two or a couple of years or a year ago where the Asher's Bakery debate was headline news throughout the world. I don't need to elaborate on that because I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. But then at a different level of persecution, throughout the world, Christianity is the most persecuted faith among the world religions. Just one simple example I read in some prayer literature to do with the persecuted church. In a place called Madhya Pradesh, India, every Sunday is a day of terror and of trauma, as frequently Christians are attacked at their churches as they gather for worship. And indeed, reading through that prayer literature and other information, there is no end to the barbarity visited on Christians in other countries throughout the world. There are 50 listed countries where Christians are not welcome or the Christian gospel is not allowed to be preached. We live in a tormented world and Christians are among the most tormented. Finally, let me say, unfortunately, Christians as followers of the Prince of Peace and sharing the gospel of salvation and also as those who seek to advance the kingdom of God and his righteousness will invariably invite rejection and with that comes persecution. It is par for the course. Of course, as Jesus said to his followers, in the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. So the one that overcome sin and death and the grave, the resurrected Lord is also sovereign in the world. We must hold to that belief. So let me now just to finish off, summarize our studies in the Beatitudes to date. When we acknowledge and repent from sin, when we humble ourselves before God and hunger and thirst after righteousness, when we show mercy in forgiving others and seek to live pure and holy lives, then we are committed to being peacemakers, whatever the cost. And the strength of our commitment to these principles of faith and conduct is found in our Lord Jesus Christ, whose life, whose death and resurrection should inspire us to turn these keys of the kingdom of God to enter and maintain our membership of the kingdom of God and the advancement of God's kingdom. And it is a challenge that you and I, as professed followers of Christ, must respond to and seek to further the kingdom of God by our witness and by our devotion to him as our crucified, risen, and indeed ascended Lord. 
Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father in heaven, as we work our way through those wonderful beatitudes of Jesus, help us to grasp their application to our lives. That through our witness, we may touch the lives of others, that they may become peacemakers as we profess to be, that through our witness, they also may make their peace with God with, through faith in Jesus as Saviour and Lord. And we pray this in his name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. Turning to our hymn books now, we continue our worship as we sing hymn 255, Christ is Risen, Hallelujah. standing we affirm our faith as we say together the Nicene Creed on page 205. We believe in one God. We, we believe, believe in one God, God the Father, Father the Almighty, Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for our Saviour. He came down from heaven, was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. 
and and his his kingdom kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic and apostolic Church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated for prayer. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, you promised through your Son, Jesus Christ, to hear the prayers of those who ask in faith. Lord of your people, strengthen your church in all the world, especially those facing persecution for their faith. At home, renew the life of this diocese of Armagh and bless our Archbishop John and build us up in faith and in love. Lord of all creation, look with favour on the world that you have made. Guide the nations in the ways of justice and peace and bless us in Northern Ireland. And bless, Lord, our Queen and all set in authority over us. We pray, Lord, that in these trying days they may know your wisdom and guidance in guiding our affairs. Lord of our relationships, comfort and sustain the communities in which we live and work, remembering especially the life, work and witness of our parish. So help us to love our neighbours as ourselves. Enable us to serve our family and friends and to love one another as you love us, remembering too the work of all Christian missions and charities at home and abroad. And Lord of all healing, relieve and protect those who are sick or suffering at home or in hospital known to us. And be with those who have any special need that are known to us, that they may know your blessing and healing touch. And deliver all who know danger, violence or oppression. And especially think of the people of Ukraine at this terrible time. And Lord of eternity, Bind us together by your Holy Spirit in communion with all who have confessed the faith of Christ and have died in the peace of Christ, that we may entrust ourselves and our whole life to you, Lord God, and come with all your sins to the joy of your eternal kingdom. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And we sum up our prayers as we find on page 206 with the words, Merciful Father, Merciful Father, Accept these our prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. And we continue in prayer as we unite in the prayer of humble access on page 207. We do not presume. We do not presume to come to this your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. We're not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs onto your table. But you are the same Lord, whose nature is always to have mercy. Grant us therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body, and our souls washed through his most precious blood, that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Amen. Christ is our peace. He has reconciled us to God in one body by the cross. We meet in his name and share his peace. The peace of the Lord be always with you and also with you. We sing hymn number 675, Peace, Perfect Peace. Perfect peace and first peace within 
peace, perfect peace, with longing to his breast. Please be seated for prayer. Let us pray. You find the Thanksgiving prayer on page 209 of your prayer books. The Lord is here. His Spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Father, almighty and ever-living God, at all times and in all places, it is right to give you thanks and praise. And so with all your people, with the angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name forevermore, more praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed are you, Father, the creator and sustainer of all things. You made us in your own image. Male and female, you created us. Even when we turned away from you, you never ceased to care for us. But in your love and mercy, you freed us from the slavery of sin giving your only begotten Son to become man and to suffer death on the cross to redeem us. He made there the one complete and all-sufficient sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. He instituted and in his holy gospel commanded us to continue a perpetual memory of his precious death until he comes again. On the night that he was betrayed, he took bread and when he given thanks to you, he broke it. He gave it to his disciples, saying, Take eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. And when he given thanks to you, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often you shall drink it in remembrance of me. Therefore, Father, with this bread and this cup, we do as Christ your Son commanded. We remember his passion and death. We celebrate his resurrection and ascension, and we look for the coming of his kingdom. Accept through him, our great high priest, this our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. And as we eat and drink these holy gifts, Grant by the power of the life-giving Spirit that we may be made one in your holy church and partakers of the body and blood of your Son, that we may dwell, he may dwell in us and we in him. Through the same Jesus Christ our Lord, 
by whom and with whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory are yours, Almighty Father, forever and ever. Amen. And we continue on page 218 and unite in the prayer which our Lord has taught us. And we are bold to say, Our Father, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The bread which we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. We being many are one body, for we all share in the one bread. Receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for you, and his blood which he shed for you. Remember that he died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is given for you, preserve your body and soul in everlasting life. Take and eat this, and remember that Christ died for you, and feed in him in your heart by faith with thanksgiving. Amen. Amen.
Let us bow our heads in prayer. Father of all, we give you thanks and praise that when we were still far off, you met us in your Son and brought us home. Dying and living, he declared your love. Give us grace and open the gate of glory. May we who share Christ's body live his risen life. We who drink his cup bring life to others. We whom the Spirit lights give light to the world. So keep us firm in the hope that you set before us, so that we and all your children shall be free, and the whole earth live to praise your name. We pray this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And we unite in the concluding prayer on page 220, beginning, Almighty God. Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. Amen. Our concluding hymn this morning is aptly, Soldiers of Christ Arise. able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our risen Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord, both now and forevermore. Amen. And now may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit rest and abide upon each one of us this Easter day and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother.